Awesome. Cool. So today's lecture on the surface, if you were just to like read the text and read the facts, seems really kind of obvious, dry and boring. But I really want to kind of challenge that a little bit because this idea is what has founded kind of entire like philosophical disciplines in the past. Like this is what existentialism is all about. Um, it's about challenging what we've been told to do and trying to find meaning in our own life outside of those structures. Uh, there was uh, a guy named Yuval Harari. He wrote a book called Sapiens, talking about like what makes us different as humans, right? And one of the main things that he came across was that we as humans are able to organize in extremely large numbers, but in a flexible way. So like ants and bees can organize in really high numbers, but they're, they're really rigid. They have to follow the same kind of things that they do. But we've been able to create these just elaborate societies that have just like, we can walk into a store and we have this, this paper, this green paper that we have a belief that it actually means something. We can hand it to a complete stranger and they can give us something in exchange for that, right? The only reason that that's possible is because we've created a belief system Right? We've created this structure where we can trust complete strangers to fill specific roles, to fill specific norms. And that structure is incredibly interesting in how it controls our behavior. Right? Um, the philosopher Nietzsche talks a lot about like most of us go through life just following these structures. Right? Most of our life is just kind of doing what people expect of us, doing what people tell us to do. But What's kind of challenging is to really reflect on this structure, reflect on like what people are telling us to do, what people are expecting of us to do, and trying to find ourselves in all of that, like what we actually want to do. And so a lot of today's lecture is going to be about social norms and about roles and role differentiation, which on the surface just look really kind of obvious, and they are because we interact with them every single day. But I want you to really think about your behavior moving forward and think about like, what is it that you do that's dictated by societal expectations, that's dictated by expectations from your family, from your friends and all of these other people. And what things are you doing because you want to do them? Not because it's expected of the role that you're filling or expected because of the position that you're in or the environment that you're in, but because you actually want to do it. So today we're going to break this down into a couple of different sections. So first we're going to explore what we call norms, right? So these are things that uh, kind of gradually emerge in groups as we compare ourselves to others, as we kind of average our behavior and, and just kind of do what everybody else is doing. Uh, and it is really what has structured society. Uh, and then we'll look at, at roles, right? And this is a kind of really broad category. This could refer to roles that you have in specific jobs that you're a part of, but this could also be roles that you have in your family as a brother, as a husband, as a father, whatever it is. And we'll look at how all of these different roles tend to conflict with one another and produce uh, a lot of stress in your life and how to kind of avoid those types of situations. Um, and then at the end, we'll look at how a lot of this stuff is looked at kind of from a research perspective so that we can kind of zoom out and see what the structure actually looks like. Um, we know a lot about kind of these individual interactions that we have with people and how these norms kind of look, uh, but we'll look at how we can kind of map those out with social network methods. Cool. So this is a kind of a repeat of everything I just said, because uh, this is just kind of an overview slide. So group structure in general is exactly those three components that we just talked about. So it's going to involve the norms, which there's a lot of different kinds of norms that we'll get into. Uh, it's the roles, so the, the specific position that I'm in, uh, which is kind of fascinating. When you think about roles in general, it just seems like, oh, yeah, that's my job or whatever. But really think about how you're perceived by others because of your role. Right? You all perceive me in a very different way as a teacher than you would if I had met you at a bar or if I had grown up with you around the corner or if like, my wife sees me in a very different way than you guys do. Right? So roles have a really, really big impact on how you're perceived in the community. Um, and so the, the kind of overall idea, and this, is, this comes back to that speech I gave at the very beginning of class that dynamic systems, 
are really unpredictable at the individual level. We don't know what people are going to do. But if you zoom out, you can really see that there is kind of a structure. There are rules that people are following. And if you can understand that, then you can have some predictive power in understanding why people do the things that they do. So that's what this point is, right? It's, it's all about predictability. And that's why these things emerge in the first place, is because we want to create a system where we're not constantly second guessing what that person at the store is going to do, right? Are they going to accept my money and give me something in return or are they going to steal it and run away with everything that I own, right? <laughs> Society gives us a situation where we can trust in the system itself and we can move without a lot of stress because all of those things are kind of taken care of. So norms, really, really, really powerful. Uh, these are things that that guide our behavior without any type of attention, right? We just do these things naturally throughout the course of the day. And it's, they can be kind of insidious, right? They're built into our culture. I mean, think about uh, the, the feminist movement was all about trying to reshape the way that women were viewed in society and the expectations that were put on them, right? And those expectations, even though they may not have been insidious from parents, like, oh, you're a pretty little girl, you do all of these things, right? As you grow up, those are the behaviors that you start to espouse, right? Those are the behaviors you take on because of the norms of your society. It wasn't until 150, 200 years ago that we started to actually believe in like romantic love and like the norms around marriage were all about financial transactions, right? So it's, it's something that we really have to pay attention to in order to actually know what these norms are. So one of the main components of norms is that they're emergent. So this is something that happens over time. As we interact with one another, as we behave with one another, we kind of compare ourselves to other people, we see what other people are doing, and we all kind of fall in line, right? Because they're consensual. They're things that we kind of agree on as a society that like this is the way that we should do things. And sometimes it's laid down in law, you don't do this or you get punished, but there are a lot of things that are just cultural, right? There are certain households where you take your shoes off when you come inside, that's just what you do. And if you grow up in a household where that was the thing that you did and then you go over to someone's house that doesn't do that, it's like, whoa, cognitive dissonance, right? And this is the main kind of motivator here, right? Is that this is all about controlling large amounts of people, right? We, in order for us to live in a large society, we have to have these predictable rules. We have to have some type of direction and motivation that everybody kind of follows so that we can make our decisions accordingly and know kind of where people are going. But it involves tons of stuff. Interactions between people, the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we hold ourselves in certain situations, our posture, our eye contact. All of these things are dictated by just evolution in society and how these things have been done in large groups. And it's, it's a shock when you go, I mean, I lived in the Middle East for a year, when you think that your life is super normal and then you drop yourself in a completely different culture and you're woken up at five o'clock every morning to the call to prayer, like, it's a, it's a different reality. So this one, I want you to mainly focus on these first two norms that we're going to talk about. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. They can kind of fall into multiple categories at the same time. Uh, but the first two are prescriptive and proscriptive. So these are your, your favorite exam questions where they're almost the exact same word. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so prescriptive norms are ones that are defining how you should behave, right? This is kind of the role of parents is to really like shape your little child into this well-functioning social being, right? Like, you need to have good manners. You need to say thank you and please and all of these things, right? Uh, you need to share in these situations and you need to be nice to people. Um, so these are things that, that you should do. Proscriptive norms, on the other hand, are things that you should not do, right? So this kind of falls into the same category, but this is like you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't cheat. So what usually happens is that you have certain structures in society are responsible for kind of the, the moral upbringing of people. They're saying, this is how you should behave. You should have these values of being a good person and being virtuous. Law takes the other side, 
right? This is the form of, of government. So you can kind of see like early on in society, religion kind of took the prescriptive side and government kind of took the proscriptive side of saying like there has to be consequences when you do these things that are unacceptable in society. And so a lot of kind of our identity principles fall into these prescriptive norms. This is how, this is how a, a good little boy acts and this is how a good little girl acts and these are the kind of things that are expected of you. Um, and so you'll see that these kind of fall into some similar categories. So descriptive norms are, and I'll use an example that kind of describes the difference between these two. So um, injunctive is all about what you ought to do, right? We all know that we ought to eat a healthy diet, we should eat salad, we should exercise, we should do all these things. Descriptive norms are what we see everybody actually doing, right? So it's like, well, yeah, I know that I should probably eat a salad, but like Johnny's eating a really yummy looking hamburger and that looks good right now and those candy bars look really good uh, and everybody else is doing it. Uh, that's kind of the way to think about descriptive norms. It's, it's what everyone's doing, right? Everybody loves that movie that just came out. And so like, I'm supposed to love it too because I wanna be a part of this group. And so injunctive is more about kind of the looking down the road of like, what, what should we do? And descriptive is like, yeah, we should do that, but everybody else is doing this. And so you'll see this, these kind of different categories hit your life in very different ways, right? And all of them are controlling in some way. They all have some kind of impact on your behavior without you really even thinking about a lot of these. And it's something that this kind of came up on another slide, but um, this is the idea of emergence and just kind of tying this temporal component into it is that this is something that takes a lot of time. It's as, as we interact with one another, our beliefs and our behaviors and everything start to align with one another. And so it usually leads to this, this kind of implicit standard, right? We never had to sit down and have a conversation about what we should do because when we interacted as a group, uh, we kind of came to the conclusion that like hitting leads to consequences and lying leads to consequences. And so we kind of started to accept that without having to have these like formal conversations about it. But sometimes they do emerge from kind of having an actual discussion. And this really kind of draws back to the last um, lecture that we had when we were talking about group development, right? So a lot of the times you end up as a group in a conflict stage, right? You end up something bad happens and you have to figure out how to get through that conflict, right? Like, I don't like the way that so-and-so is approaching their work. Um, and so what ends up happening is you have a discussion and you build structure around that, that creates norms for the future of like, okay, this is how we should engage with one another moving forward. Um, and this is something I kind of talked about last time as being something that you should probably engage in in your daily life, right? That you should notice what kind of things, what kind of cycles you're in that are implicit, right? These conflict cycles that you just keep going through over and over and over again and actually take some time to bring those up and have discussions about them, create some structure around them, develop norms to move forward. Um, and this is kind of the, kind of the rule here uh, in most cases is that you have kind of an average behavior that pops up in all of these groups. Whenever you have someone that's too extreme on this end or too extreme on the other end, um, that ends up being viewed very unfavorably by the other group members until everyone kind of reaches this kind of average behavior. And this can ver be very different from culture to culture, right? There are some cultures that are very confrontational in nature, right? I remember I used to take phone calls for Verizon Wireless when I was like 19, customer service, and I, I started getting calls from the South. And I'd get these calls that are just like, oh, sweetheart, it's not your fault that my bill is so high. Like, it's okay. And then I got switched to the Northeast and it was just like, are you kidding me? Like, what can you do for me? <laughs> right? It's very different. And so, and you notice that a lot of it, like I said, is, is average, right? You end up in these cultures. You're around a bunch of people that have adopted a certain way of doing things. And so you just kind of fit in. You compare yourself to these other people. 
I didn't mean to butcher that southern accent. <laughs> uh, so, uh, my wife wants to move back to the south so bad. <laughs> I gotta say, like, I would love grits on every menu, but. <laughs> Uh, so when you look at this from like a research standpoint, because uh, a lot of social scientists are really interested in how these things emerge and how they're how they're kind of kept, even though sometimes they're they're not useful, right? Like imagine a group that like every time they start a meeting, they have some like chant that they do that takes like 10 minutes of their meeting time, and, and everybody's like, "This is really stupid. Why do we why do we keep doing this?" But they just keep doing it because it's like the normal way of doing it. So this group, they started to study these norms and they started to notice that there's this kind of generational thing where these norms are really, really resistant to change, right? So they started these experiments where they were creating groups, they were having them do some type of experiment um, and they were seeing kind of what norms then kind of continued as you changed group membership. So even if the original group members weren't even there anymore, were there behaviors that kind of stayed? And so this is a really simple, uh, this isn't in your slides, I kind of put this in this morning as an example. Um, so this is a really simple example of uh, a study that they did. That's, it's not like a societal norm or anything like that. They put people into a dark room and there was this one pinpoint of light in the middle. And there's something that happens with our eyes. Our eyes naturally move. And so if, you're, if there's just one point of light in the room, it actually looks like that light is moving. This is why it looks like stars are twinkling and things like that. But they asked all of these people, how far on average was this light moving, right? And when they answered individually, there was a lot of variation in their answers, right? Some people said that it was just an inch, other were more around three, this one was kind of like up by nine. But if you had them answer this as a group, over a couple of sessions, everybody kind of converged to the same answer. Everybody was like, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess we're on the same page. The interesting thing is that when you start to replace people, this group norm stays as you add more people. And they even did a case where they had one person have some extreme number to start out with, like 15 inches. And it made the average like way up here. And they ended up changing out the group membership, I think, what, like seven times, six times, before it started to correct back to something that was actually useful, and that was actually like normal. And so it shows how we can create these group norms. We can kind of come together and say, okay, you know what, yeah, we're gonna get on the same page, we're gonna coordinate our behavior, and we're just gonna go with this. And even if this is really arbitrary, has no actual like, meaningful use in the real world, it stays and it keeps being adopted by new members as new members get brought in. Um, and a lot of the times it'll just kind of persist even though there's no use for it anymore, right? And so that's kind of a silly example, but think about this in terms of like actual things that we do in society, the way that our society is structured the way that we're expected to behave in certain situations, the type of people we're expected to be. Like these are group norms that were decided by our grandparents, by our great grandparents, that are still kind of persisting until this day. And we're in a really interesting position as like the first generation that has information at our fingertips, right? Like <laughs> until today or until the last 20 years, you couldn't really like look up whether this was like a normal thing. You just went through your life doing what your family did, what your grandparents did. Um, I mean, this is something that we as parents, my wife and I are, are really trying to fight of this like generational cycle, this generations of trauma of like, I'm gonna raise my kid the way that my parents raised their kid, the way that their parents raised their kid. Now we have access to hundreds of research articles that are like, no, you should probably raise it like this, right? And so this is something to, to really kind of jar you out of that, to really get you to start thinking about why it is that you're doing the things that you do. Uh, and so this is something I, I already hinted on, but uh, is that they're really resistant to revision. And a lot of these cases, like the example I just gave, I can't really tell my mom, <laughs> I'm not doing what you did because it's wrong without her thinking that I'm judging her, right? She thinks that what she did was entirely normal. And like, I don't, I don't hold any ill will against her for doing it, but it's what makes a lot of these things hard to change because people kind of adopt them as part of their identity, 
right? And you have these, these odd interactions, these odd norms, putting bourbon on your, your kid's gums when they're teething <laughs> kind of stuff, you know what I mean? Like, they're, they're really resistant because it's just like, oh, well, my grandma did it and my great grandma did it. Um, but there's a huge benefit to this and it's why we're all sitting in this classroom today is that even though a lot of these norms can be kind of arbitrary, can even be kind of damaging and detrimental, they maintain group stability, right? They define what the group is itself, right? We are a group that does things this way. And it gives you some kind of pride in being a part of that group, right? It's like, yeah, I do things this way. This is the group that I'm a part of. So there's a huge part of this that yes, norms can be kind of detrimental. They're things that you should kind of focus on and challenge, but a lot of the norms are there for a really good reason because they, they, they structure the activity in that group and they, they make it predictable. The other side of this is roles, right? So this is another one of those slides. Like, I remember when I first put this PowerPoint together, I was like, I'm gonna tell all my students about roles. <laughs> like, you guys all know what a role is. Uh, but I want you to start thinking about it kind of in a different way of, it's not just that I am supposed to do this, it's that what I am told I'm supposed to do is something that was created. It's something that was structured, right? It's something that we can kind of question, that we can think about. It's not absolute, but it defines kind of the behaviors that are expected when you fill a certain position. Um, and like I said earlier, this is not just in a work setting, this is in a life setting, uh, whether you're a member of a leisure group, whether you're a member of a family, uh, there are different roles that are associated with every single type of social interaction that you're a part of, right? And it's another, it's not the same as norms because it's, it's not the norm itself that's dictating what you should do, it's what the role kind of defines. Uh, usually it's the case that the role is something that was created before someone was found to fill that role. You can think about this especially in terms of like businesses and things like that. They, they figure out what they need and what they need help with and then they hire people to fill those roles. Um, but the key word here is often because like the role of, I guess the role of brother and father existed before I was one. but. Um, <laughs> But some of those roles are ones that you have to kind of define on the, on the fly. So, uh, and this is something I, I've already kind of hinted at, that once you're in a sp certain position, you're expected to act a particular way. And this is something that, uh, especially when you're younger, um, and I think it's, it's very apparent in collectivist cultures and things when you think about authority and how people think about authority, is that I think in individualistic countries, we tend to view people as people and less as roles. And it takes a little bit of the authority away from the role because we're able to kind of pull the veil back a little bit. I think it's something that's happening a lot in Western medicine right now, where it's like, you're not this God on a pedestal that knows everything. You're actually just like a person that, that took some classes and kind of knows some stuff. I've seen some really crappy doctors, but, um, yeah, something to remember is that the person that graduates last of their class from medical school is still called doctor. Uh, <laughs> just saying so. So, <laughs> uh, but something that's really important to think about is the, the individuality that's still kind of built into this, right? So even though a role dictates how you should probably behave in that certain situation, people tend to fill roles in different ways depending on their personality and the way that they interact with other people. And so it can kind of redefine the role in a way. Um, but that's usually the case and it's usually tolerated as long as what you're doing doesn't stray too far away from what the actual requirements of that role are, right? Or else the, the group's gonna be upset. And this is something that is very, I think, uniquely human. I've been thinking a lot about role differentiation lately. Uh, if you think back, like think about our closest relatives, right? You have chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, there's not pretty explicit like role requirements in these groups, right? Like there's gender roles, like some of the, the males are, are more apt to be hunters and the females are more apt to stay at home and care for the young. But when in terms of like explicit roles, like I'm gonna do this and you're gonna do that, 
I don't think that really comes online until we have language, right? Until we can really define to one another, like, look, I got this. If you go do that. And it allows us to do it in a way where we can interact with complete strangers. Whereas like chimps and bonobos, in order for them to really coordinate their activity, they have to know that other chimp really, really well. And know like, okay, I know that they usually go that way, so I'm gonna go this way. But we've created this system with language where we can say like, I got this, you got that, I'm gonna do this. And it allows us to split the load and I think that's why we've been able to accomplish such amazing things in society is because we've been able to split these really complicated tasks down into these individual roles and spread the workload and really define those, those roles, right? And so um, a lot of this happens, and this would be kind of the example of like chimps and bonobos and things like that, uh, but even in human society as well, that sometimes our roles are something that we just kind of fall into that we, we just start doing something and then that becomes kind of our responsibility. You can think about this in terms of like your position in your family, like family roles. Uh, there's this really interesting one that comes up in the addiction work that I'm doing uh, where it talks about like the multiple siblings and you have, uh, you have the, the forgotten child that is the one that like is always craving attention because the attention is always on other people. Uh, and you have the mascot that's trying to like make everybody laugh and trying to like bring some levity to the situation. And you have like the problem child that's like doing all the bad stuff. Like all of these, these are, these are roles, right? These are roles that you just kind of fell into. It wasn't like, <laughs> you're the mascot, you're the forgotten child. Uh, but what you start to see is that as this happens, and this is something really interesting within society, is that the roles become really, really specialized, right? So think about this in terms of like the evolution of like tribal societies, right? You have a role that may have started as like a, uh, a gathering role, right? Of like, we're all going out together and we're all gathering food. But over time, you gather this, I'm gonna gather this. And then over time, you gather that, I'll cut that, right? And they start to become really, really specialized as you're able to kind of divvy out the work. And this is a really interesting point here. And this is something that you can kind of look to in the groups that you're a part of. If all of a sudden you start seeing like this massive role dif like proliferation of like, oh man, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. Uh, it's usually because you're facing some really difficult problem, the group is. So you've hit some type of wall, you're starting to run out of money, you're in some type of an emergency all of a sudden you have to start creating a bunch of roles because what everybody's been doing doesn't really help the situation that we're in right now. And so we'll go through a couple types of roles. The really interesting stuff that, that I really wanna get into is the, the kind of role stress because that's I think what a lot of you can probably relate to is like what happens when all of the roles that we have are hard to juggle. Um, but this is, Something I've been hinting at the whole class that's gonna come up all the time is that so much of group dynamics is split among these two, um, these two roles, right? And these two activities of task versus relationship stuff. And that's how you really kind of build cohesion. That's how you move forward as a group is that you have to be accomplishing something. The group usually has some type of purpose, uh, but you also have to maintain the relationships within that group. And so when you're thinking about task roles, usually thinking about explicit like job roles that you have, um, trying to accomplish some type of task, whether it's data entry or sweeping or serving food, like those are all task roles. Uh, but the relationship roles are often really overlooked and like they, they, sound, they sound funny, right? Supporter, clown, and critic. It's like, can you imagine applying for the cloud job, <laughs> right? Just like, I'd be, I'd be really good at just making light of everything. <laughs> uh, but it's important. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like a job that you get paid for, but these roles are, are often put down in certain situations of like, we don't, we don't need any levity. We don't need people to, to criticize what we're doing. We don't need like explicit support. Uh, but those are what lead to higher productivity in the task roles, is having someone that can, can meet these relationship roles and influence the relationships. So this is 
this is something we've, uh, it seems kind of obvious, uh, right, is that we are in the positions we are because we can't do it on our own, right? We live in a society in which we do not make our own food for the most part. Like some of us may have gardens, but like I saw a dude on YouTube that ate only the stuff he grew for a year, but like that's the only time that I've ever seen that, right? Uh, we don't, like there is not one person on this earth that knows how to build a cell phone, right? There is someone that knows how to program the software. There's someone that knows how to create the cogs. There's someone that knows how to make the cases for it. This is an iPhone 6 that I'm using because my phone crapped out on me. Uh, <laughs> I, but when you really think about that, there's no one person that created that, right? There are people, like the engineers are probably the closest to knowing how all of those components kind of work together, but none of it was accomplished without collective activity, right? And the reason we can't fulfill all those different roles is why this differentiation process happens in the first place, right? And so uh, what usually happens is that you can hold a lot of roles early on, um, but as things progress, things start to specialize, you start to take on specific ones. Um, and a lot of that kind of happens out of the conflict stages because different roles kind of conflict with one another, and we'll talk about that on the, the next slide. But um, and this is also talking about uh, task and relationship stuff. Sorry, I was all kind of off point a little bit. Because um, this also gets at uh, managerial stuff. Stuff is really important here. It's really, really hard to fill task and relationship roles, right? To be someone's boss and to also be their friend. Um, and to even just get work done while also trying to maintain relationships around you. It is a really hard balancing act. And so a lot of the times early on, you can, you can hold that. But as things get more complex, as things get more specialized, it's really hard to, to keep that going. Um, and this is kind of something that's really interesting is that like task roles tend to be what create a lot of the conflict. Um, it's like not liking how the other group members are approaching their work or not liking how the management is organizing our goals and our productivity. Um, how they're coordinating our payments and how we get paid for the work that we do. All of that is kind of wrapped up in this task role situation, right? And so that, that creates a lot of the negative stuff that happens in a group. And the problem is that there's not enough groups that rely on the other side of this to start fixing that, right? Because the relationship roles are the ones that that are like, like, look, let's come together, let's talk about this, let's figure out why we're not on the same page with these tasks and like work through this conflict, create some structure, create some norms, like bring the tension down and work collectively to come up with solutions to the problems. Um, these are coveted roles. Um, and I think that once groups realize how powerful these can be, they start to embrace them a little bit more. Um, but it's not until they face a lot of conflict that it's obvious that those need to be there in the first place. Oh, we're not going to get into that until a little bit later, it looks like. Okay, cool. So we'll get into uh, <laughs> group membership real quick before we look at kind of the, the stress processes. Uh, so they, in the research, it's called socialization. So it's the process of becoming a group member, right? And it talks about it being a mutual process because as a group member, I'm expected to assimilate, right? I'm expected to... Uh, take on the values and the beliefs and the norms, all the rules and everything that this institution kind of dictates, right? What it means to be a UO student, like you have to assimilate to a lot of the things that that requires. Um, but there's also an accommodation process, right? So there's also a process in which the group recognizes that it's a group made up of individuals that have their own desires and needs and goals and motivations and that they need to respect and accept a lot of that. Um, and this is where a lot of the, the conflict arises as the balancing act between how much do you need to conform versus how much am I open to change that comes from kind of a grassroots movement. And it's kind of driven by this, this structure that we have in groups that each of us are trying to find particular roles. I mean, this comes back to, I mentioned Nietzsche at the beginning. Uh, meaning making, right? We're constantly trying to figure out meaning in our life, where we belong, what roles we're supposed to fit. And so we end up chasing roles that our society has dictated as being prestigious, as being good roles, 
right? But in order to get to those, as newcomers, you have to, you have to push a good broom in order to not push a broom anymore, right? You have to learn your place. And so there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of uncertainty that comes with like, is what I'm doing right now meaningful, right? Is, is pushing this broom actually leading to something good in my life? And so there's, there's a lot of keeping the ultimate goal in mind of like, this is where I wanna be, this is what I wanna do in order to actually climb that ladder in the first place. But you have the other side too, which is that the actual members that have been members for a long time also have to, uh, to kind of take on new roles as the group kind of goes through new and complicated things but also work with these people that are coming in and start to accommodate their needs and do all of those kind of things. And so there's, there's a lot of kind of push and pull of being a group member of like giving up some of your individual pursuits for what the group actually needs. And so this is just kind of a, an overview slide of, which, of what we're gonna go into real quick, but they break this down into um, a stage process, kind of like we were talking about in the last lecture with group development. And there's specific behaviors that you can kind of look at. Uh, and I, there's some stuff on a couple of these slides that I think are actually really helpful uh, when you think about your position in new jobs, your position in new groups, friend groups, leisure groups, whatever it is. Because uh, there are certain things that you can kind of hone in on. So, uh, the investigation stage, this is where you're really early on. You've just joined the group and a lot of your motivations at the beginning are around trying to figure out what this group is, right? You're trying to collect information. You're trying to figure out who fills what roles, who's in charge, where the influence hierarchies are, how communication flows through the group, who's responsible for what. And you as a newcomer are usually not trusted at the beginning. There's a lot of companies that will put you on kind of a, a two week or a three week window, like trial period to make sure that they can trust you to do all of these things as you start accepting the, the norms and all of the role requirements that you have to do. But this is where it gets really interesting, right? So when you're a newcomer, you often prolong how long you're viewed as a new newcomer based on how you act. And a lot of the time, if you think of yourself as a newcomer, it causes you to act like one. <laughs> and so there's the cliche, fake it till you make it, is super true. Because if you are acting like you don't know what you're supposed to do, you're acting like you just like shouldn't be here, you're, you have imposter syndrome, all of these things, people are gonna see that and it's gonna make you less trustworthy. And you're gonna be in this position even longer, right? First time I taught this class, I was faking it until I made it. <laughs> I'm about to teach a bunch of counselors how to do addiction counseling, right? Like, <laughs> I'll figure it out. But if I project that early on, then I'm not going to be viewed. I'm not going to be trusted, right? And it impacts how other people are going to see me. But as you start to socialize, so the big part here is for exam stuff, just know that socialization is linked to this higher commitment. You're accepting all of these roles and these, uh, these duties that are put on you. You're accepting all of the, the norms. Um, and you start to socialize with the rest of the group. You start to be accepted as a group member. And you have the socialization process then hits the, the veteran group members as well because they have to start adapting the way that they do things to how things are changing as new people are brought in. The whole you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> like uh, A lot of the times they're stuck in their norms, right? They've been doing something the same way for a really long time and they've been doing it the same way that everyone else was doing it. And then all of a sudden they look around one day and they're the only one that's still around from seven years ago. And everyone's doing stuff different, right? And they've never taken the time to adjust and to re-average their behavior. But what ends up happening all the time is that you end up in a maintenance phase. Uh, and this is just some fancy research term for the fact that you've hit an impasse, right? You are not sure whether you want to keep going or whether or not you should negotiate for some type of better position, 
right? I've been working this job for 10 years, I've been doing everything that you asked me to do, I'm gonna quit if you don't give me a raise, right? Uh, you end up at this situation where you have to actually advocate for yourself. And it's a lot easier said than done, right? To take that step into <laughs> your boss's office and be like, hey, see me, recognize me, look at me as a person and notice that like I am doing a lot for this company. And so what ends up happening is that you go through this negotiation phase with the group itself, right? You may be talking to the manager or whatever, but you're actually negotiating with the group of saying like, I want to move up. I want to climb this ladder. I want to fill a different role that benefits the group as a whole. And so, uh, and it's mainly due to the fact that uh, most jobs are not rewarding, right? Uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, I mean, it's a, it's a silly thing to say, but um, there's huge movements around like the, the difference between communism and capitalism. Communism is based around allowing people to figure out what they want to do instead of forcing them into these jobs in this profit motive industry. The problem is that cleaning the sewers is not what someone's going to naturally say, like, I was meant to do this, right? And so there's this balancing act of like, how do we motivate people to do the jobs that need to be done, but still embrace their individuality and their need to progress and to rise in society? And it's not an easy question to answer. And that's why that's how you end up in these negotiation situations. And it builds to a transition, right? And so this is where you either decide I'm going to leave or they decide you're going to leave because you're not meeting the, the, the rules and the expectations or whatever. Um, and you then move to uh, the resocialization phase. And so this is where your future is uncertain. You don't know what's going to happen next. And so this a uh, lot of different things that can happen here, right? It can be the individual saying, I'm not getting anything out of this, right? I'm tired of being a grad student that makes $1,800 a month. Uh, can I do something different? Uh, but here's a prestige carrot I'll hold over your head. Uh, but it can also be caused by the group, right? And so the group can say, like, look, you're not meeting our expectations, and so we need to figure out what to do here. And so the outcomes here are that you either kind of find out something to do. So you work through these accommodation and assimilation processes of like, uh, and that's what a negotiation is, right? These are fancy words for saying like, uh, I want to do this. I'm advocating for myself. You want me to do this. Let's meet in the middle, right? And let's move forward with this new understanding that I'm now going to fill this role. I'm now going to have this much money. Um, the other side is that the group can kick you out or you can quit. Right, and that moves to the remembrance phase. Oh, I'm just remembering how great it was, <laughs> right? So uh, I would focus kind of in terms of uh, exam stuff, uh, really focus in on just what those individual words were because I'm not testing you on a lot of the components of this. Uh, this is just a, a nice example of how you can think about how you progress through groups, right? and really think about where you are in that stage. And knowing that a negotiation stage even exists is really important, right? Like, it's, it's important for you to understand that you can advocate for yourself and that your role as a member of that group is completely contingent on them supporting you, right? Like, they're giving you resources, they're giving you a job, but you're also giving them something as well and there's somewhere that that needs to be negotiated. This is kind of my favorite part of the lecture, though, because this is getting into all of the different things that we're juggling, right? Uh, sometimes what we're doing conflicts with other things that we're expected to do, and that produces a lot of anxiety. It produces a lot of stress. It leads to depression, um, because sometimes we just feel like we can't meet all of these demands of being a father, of being a student, of being an employee. Um, and balancing all of these different things. I, I heard this metaphor, I can't remember who it was, it was an author, and she was asked, how do you balance all of these things with work, with life, with your family, all of these things? 
and, and still just like produce as much as you do in all of this. And she said, you know, I always imagine it as a juggling act where I have glass balls and I have plastic balls. And which balls are glass and which ones are plastic change on any given day. Sometimes the family balls are plastic, right? Sometimes there's a baseball game, it's the middle of the season, you know what, it's okay if I drop that one, it's not gonna shatter. Things are not gonna be ruined and over, right? But sometimes the family ones are really important. Graduation, right? That's a glass ball, I'm not gonna drop that ball. Sometimes work is a glass ball, right? I have a deadline I have to hit and I need to sacrifice some of my, my family stuff, some of those plastic balls that are up in the air right now so that I don't drop this glass ball. And that's, that's a huge balancing act that you have to go through as life. I mean, right now I'm under a mountain of it, right? Trying to finish a PhD, TAing for a course, I'm teaching a course, I'm building a course, I have all my research responsibilities, I manage a team of six or seven research assistants, I have like all of this stuff. To, and then I'm a father and I'm a husband. I see my wife for 30 minutes to an hour a night at like 11 o'clock at night, right? And it's like, it's, it's tough because you think about it and you're like, which balls am I dropping? Have I defined the balls in the right way? Like, am I dropping a glass ball and don't even know it until it's too late, right? So oftentimes we, we, we chase these prestigious roles. We want these really significant roles in society. We want to be recognized and we want to feel like we're meaningful, right? And so we work towards building all of the skills and the talents that are needed for these prestigious roles. And we end up in situations where we feel meaningless when we end up in a role that doesn't feel important, right? This is the, like existential crisis that everybody goes through. It's like, what am I supposed to do? I'm sure all of you are in that position. Like, what do I do after college? You have some ideas, right? But then you end up in a job, you work it for 10, 15 years, and you're like, is this... I'm supposed to do? Is this important? Is this prestigious? Is this special? Right? And that's defined by each and every one of us. Like, that's a belief that we have about ourselves. But a lot of how these roles and how we define these roles ourselves are what produce a lot of the stress that comes from them. Right? And so if we are in a role that's really ambiguous, ambiguously, ambiguously <laughs> defined, right? There's like no clear rules around it. You're just expected to, to know what to do in any given moment, but then when you don't do the right thing, then you're in trouble and you never knew what the right thing was in the first place. That leads to a ton of stress. And I'm sure that you can all relate to that in personal relationships, right? Where it's like, it's like, oh, I didn't even know I was doing something wrong that you're like super mad at me right now about, right? Uh, those produce a ton, and t a ton of stress. Uh, but also ones that are inconsistent where it's like, okay, it was okay to do this yesterday and now it's not okay to do it today, uh, the important thing here is that we need to have roles that we feel are important but that are also really well defined. That we know exactly what's expected of us, that we know how to fill that role, um, and the big challenge is, is really kind of balancing all of that and knowing that like we're doing the right thing. This is, this is a good role, this is a good slide right here. So, um, this is what I was, I was getting at with the metaphor that I brought up, right? And so we're constantly filling so many roles. I mean, think about your, your day, right? Think about how many roles you fill in a given day, whether it's a student, an employee, a brother, a sister, a friend, a father, uh, whatever it is, all of those roles are all kind of being maintained at the same time. And you have to constantly keep all of them in mind, make sure that all of them are fulfilled. Um, but they all have their own demand on time. I don't understand how people have five or six kids, honestly. Like, I have one and I don't feel like I have enough time for him. And I think I spend more time with him than most dads do, uh, right? And it's, it's, it's something that we have to chunk our day up, our 24 hours up into these, what we're allocating our, our time to, right? And we have to pick between these different roles that we fulfill. So there's two different types of conflict that, that arise. Uh, one of them is inter-role. This is going to be another one of those exam questions you hate me for. Um, I'm sorry, ahead of time. 
but <laughs> inter means separate. Uh, so these are ones that are different roles competing with each other. So this would be my role as, uh, as a family member competing with my role as, a, uh, as an employee, right? That I have to sacrifice time with my family in order to fulfill my time as an employee. And so those two roles are conflicting with one another and I'm constantly saying like, oh, I want more time with my family or, oh, I can't have more time with my family because I have all these deadlines that I have to hit, right? Intra role, intra <laughs> being inside, um, is demands within a, a single role. Um, and so this would be, you have, uh, the example the textbook gives is supervisors being supervised. So. This would be this idea that you as a supervisor are expected to have kind of free reign to do what you need to do. And so like the role dictates that you have a lot of kind of independence, but then you're also being supervised. So you have like this conflicting role that you have of like, I'm supposed to have all of this freedom, but I'm also supposed to do what my boss expects of me. Here you have certain expectations on you from the people below you, right? They expect you to be a certain person, but then you have this other person above you that expects you to be a completely different person, right? Um, and you're trying to balance and trying to fulfill the needs of all of these different people, right? You can think of examples where you have two different bosses ask you to do something and those two things conflict with one another. And you're like, how do I do this, but also do this without yeah, the one I think that's the biggest and the most challenging is the interrole conflict, um, because that's the one that I think most of us can relate to. Most of us can really understand how much stress that produces. I know many of you are probably not parents yet, but holy crap, <laughs> I have an alarm clock that I can't snooze in the morning. <laughs> and like his demands never go away. Like there's no not making lunch, like, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, and, and then trying to balance that with all of the other stuff that I have to get done, it's, uh, it's not easy. And so, and this is the big kind of thing that comes out of that, right? So, so much of what we talk about is about how healthy groups are supposed to look, right? But so much of what we experience is the opposite of that. Like so much of what we experience is the stress, is the uncertainty, is the ambiguity, right? And this is where it comes from, right? Because these group situations are composed of individuals that are all on different pages, that all have different goals and motivations, and that produces tension, it produces conflict. And it leads to these roles not being a good fit, us thinking that we're not in a prestigious or meaningful position, thinking that we're spending too much time on this that's not meaningful and not enough time on this that's meaningful. Like that's, that's what our lives are like, especially in the society that we're in today where it's just like we're expected to fill every single minute of the day with something productive, right? You have to be filling your roles consistently all the freaking time. I like think about like 100 years ago where people actually had time to sit down and read a book. <laughs> I have to use Audible. <laughs> I listen to books on the bus. Uh, so the idea here is that the negative impacts are a lot of this kind of emotional exhaustion. I'm sure a lot of us have experienced burnout. I'm sure you experienced burnout as a student. I think the expectations that we have on students are ridiculous. Like here, take 18 credits and remember all of this stuff and apply it to your life in a meaningful way. That's, that's crap. Like we're not actually educating people. Um, and it leads to this exhaustion, which leads to a lower ability to actually bring in and retain information. Um, all of this tension that arises from it. Depersonalization is a huge one, right? If you feel like you're not fulfilling your role, if you feel like your role is not important or it's not meaningful, so much of your identity is tied to the roles that you fill. And so if those roles are not bringing you satisfaction, you're gonna have some type of an identity crisis. What, what am I doing? Who am I? What is the purpose of this, right? And as this increases, as you have a bunch of role stress within an organization, you have really big performance issues that start to arise. And that's what kind of ties into like the army crew thing that we just went through and all of that is that you have these spirals that can happen. And so, and a big part is the job satisfaction. It's that as role conflict increases, you have a lot of people that just don't report being happy in the job that they're at and they are a lot more likely to quit. 
So these are some good actionable things that we can do though. Um, and this is, think about this in terms of your relationships, whether it's your romantic relationships or friendships or business work relationships. Um, you need to set boundaries. That's what this is, right? This is saying like, this is what I'm supposed to do and this is what you're supposed to do and like make that explicit, build rules around it and really have discussions around expectations and motivations and all of that. Um, this is from kind of a managerial perspective, right? You want a workplace where you're not expected to hold multiple positions at the same time. So if you're trying to be a boss and a friend at the same time, you're not being a friend in the places that you have to be a boss. You're like socializing in another room, in a break room, you're going out for beers or whatever it may be. And it separates the expectation of friendship from the expectation of task performance. Um, this, is, this is a big one too, and this is kind of uh, what I was mentioning with the glass and the plastic bol balls, is that so much of that is something that you have to engage in. You have to deliberately think about that, right? You have to say like, in these situations, I'm gonna sacrifice this for this. And in these situations, I'm gonna sacrifice this because if you're just doing this without communicating it to others and you're just sacrificing all your family stuff without even explaining to your wife why you're sacrificing all of it, you're gonna have a great weekend, I tell you that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is one, I think it was really wordy on your slides. I tried to <laughs> tone it down a little bit, um, is that you want to max maximize role fit, right? Uh, and this is, I think, very much in terms of like business organizational type stuff is that when you're tr trying to hire someone, you should probably hire someone that has like the right personality, the right skills, the right talents for that job, or else like you're going to be unhappy with the work and they're probably going to be unhappy too because they don't know how to fill the role. Cool. So I'll go through these last ones uh, kind of quickly. We have uh, a couple more slides, about 10 minutes, I think, before I wanted to wrap up. But... Um, this really gets at how we're, we're mapping all of this from a research perspective um, and how we're really kind of taking this bird's eye view of trying to see how all of this structure kind of emerges and how we can describe it, right? And so we use these social network methods um, and there's three different types of networks that researchers use. So we'll get into each of these individually. Um, kind of the overview is that you're looking at how Influence and authority are structured in a status net network. You're looking about who likes each other in an attraction network, and you're looking at how communication flows through a network in the communication network. And so the status networks are ones where you come in as a researcher and you try to see how the influence and the authority are structured within that environment. Who is able to tell other people what to do? Who has some kind of power? Who has some kind of influence? What does the actual hierarchy look like? And so a lot of the times when you start a group, everybody kind of has equal influence, especially when you have a small group. But what we've kind of seen over time as we've talked in this class is that when the group gets bigger, the influence tends to be unequal. And when that happens, you tend to see hierarchies form where you have some people are more in charge and have more authority than others. Uh, but a lot of the times that's accepted by the group. The group kind of goes with that. It's not someone just saying like, I'm in charge. It's like, it's like I don't want to be in charge. Like, take it. Uh, and usually what you see is that this becomes, and we'll talk about uh, centralization here in a minute, but um, this is kind of a self-organizing principle is that most groups adopt a hierarchical structure. Uh, this is something that like, like, yes, there's a lot of bad things that come from these super hierarchical structures that we see in capitalism, um, but a lot of it is self-organizing. People just kind of, uh, there are more people that want to be followers than leaders. And that's just kind of the, the truth of society. Like being a leader requires a lot of responsibility. And so the leaders are usually the ones that have the most commitment to the group, the ones that have the most group identity, right? The ones that are like really on board with what the group's trying to do and trying to organize everybody. And so this is just a, a way of mapping out authority. Attraction networks, on the other hand, are ones that we've talked about before. You basically give someone 
uh, a survey that has everyone's name and you just check whether you like or dislike that person and then you can create these entire maps that show like what the structure of attraction looks like in the group and what the cohesion looks like. And so this kind of orders the members of the group um, in terms of who's the most liked, who's the, the least liked. It forms cliques and subgroups. Um, and you can see, we've talked about this before, the whole idea of kind of mutual liking would be bi-directional. I like you and you like me. Uh, you see, and these are really useful. I, the reason we're bringing it up at all is because these are really useful for organizations in order to like, as, as a leader, a lot of the times you don't know what the attraction principles are in the group that you're a part of, like who's being left out, what kind of cliques have formed. And so this really allows you to get kind of a bird's eye view on how to structure that and how to manage that. Um, this is kind of just an interesting side point. I'm not gonna, if I'm testing you on anything in these, it's these really simple principles at the top of just attraction networks being about likes and dislikes. Uh, but this is an interesting thing is that balanced networks aren't just having all of the relationships be positive, but uh, it could also be that there's like a similar number of positive and negative relationships that kind of balance each other out. And when they're, when it tips in one way or the other, there's usually a, a pretty big psychological urge to, to fix that, right? When all of a sudden a fight breaks out in the workplace and people start taking sides, there's a, a really strong urge to, to fix that. There's a dissonance that comes with that. And like it says, I, everything in this class is easier to maintain in smaller groups. It's kind of the, the goal, if you ever get into a managerial position, is to break your big groups into small ones, because that's the way to go. Uh, so communication networks are actually really interesting, because this looks at how, um, how people, what kind of information is shared from person to person. So if you think about hierarchical structures, right, like I'm not going to share personal stuff about myself to my boss. Uh, they're probably not going to share personal stuff to me, but we're going to communicate about things that may be going wrong with the, the project that I'm on. I tend to probably share more good news than bad news so that it doesn't reflect badly on me, whereas I might share bad news with my coworkers. Um, and what you'll see, this was really wordy, I need to break this down a little bit, I'm sorry. But um, what you see is that a lot of the times these parallel the attraction and the, the authority structures. And so communication tends to flow among people that like each other, and it also tends to follow this kind of pyramid uh, network scheme where like people at the bottom rung are sharing information with each other and less information with the people at the top. People at the top are sharing people, sharing information with people on the same level. Um, but this is, this is really important. So um, not in terms of testing stuff, but in terms of just conceptual knowledge, uh, is that in these centralized networks, the person that is in that central position is really, really important because they're the ones that are getting all of the information from all the people below them. And so they're usually kind of synthesizing and integrating all of the, so if you think about like a business management model, right? You have all of these individuals that all have their own projects, but then you have this person that's looking at like how all of those projects are coming together, right? And it's collecting all of that information and integrating it. And usually that person, oh, okay. And in decentralized structures, there's no kind of one central person. And we'll talk about that in a second. And the person in the central position tends to usually be the, the leader. So, but this is, uh, this is kind of interesting because you'll see this happen uh, in situations where the tasks get really complex. So we were just talking about that person that's in that centralized position being the one that kind of collects all this information from the people below them. But when the tasks get really complex, there becomes too much information to integrate. And so you can't have this kind of centralized structure anymore and you can't funnel everything through this one person and expect them to be able to handle it all. So that central person is usually the one that manages all of this communication, but as things increase, as things get more complex, as the type of information becomes really heavy and burden burdensome, uh, you need to adopt a different structure and you need to adopt a, a more decentralized one where everybody's kind of working on their own individual thing and then coming together collectively instead of trying to funnel it all through one person. So, and that's kind of the overall idea here. So, 
um, for a task question, just or for a test question, know that you move to a decentralized network when the task becomes more complex. Is that centralized or are really common, but decentralized are ones that can handle a lot more rigorous type task structures. Yeah, and the centralized role is what I was, I was hinting at, is that is usually um, the one in charge, um, and it's, it's even when they've kind of randomly been selected, they're still viewed as the leader, even if they're the one that's just like, oh yeah, let me collect everybody's survey. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, you're the leader? Yeah, and this is very, very true in businesses is that, um, and you can think about it in terms of everything we've talked about up until now, is that the centralized role is viewed as, as a prestigious role. Like, we're in a capitalist society, we're trying to climb the ladder, the ladder involves moving up the hierarchy. And so when you get to one of these positions, there's kind of a sunken cost fallacy. It's like I've put a lot of work in to get here, and so there's a, they're a lot less likely to quit. And the ones in the bottom rungs are the ones that probably feel like their job is unimportant, um, probably feel like they're looking at a bunch of trees instead of the forest and have no idea why they're doing what they're doing, and so they tend to quit a lot more, and they tend to quit in clumps. And this is... This is a huge part of our society. And this comes back to what I was talking about earlier with like, not a lot of people wanna clean the sewers or whatever. Uh, in a capitalist society, there are way less prestigious roles than there are non-prestigious roles, right? And so the whole like process of meaning making is personal. It's not about like having to have that best, that best job because there aren't very many of them. We're not all gonna get that best job. It's how you can find some type of meaning and some type of happiness in the role that you're in, in the, the route that you're on. So, and I think this is the last slide. Um, so this talks about how, this is, this is really interesting, um, and a lot of it is kind of obvious, but um, the downward flowing movement in these hierarchies, uh, so if you're thinking of leaders to followers or bosses to employees, um, is usually kind of, uh, proscriptive, right? You shouldn't do this or, and like, I need you to do this. I need you to accomplish this. It's about the tasks and the actions that need to be taken, right? Um, the, the logic around that and why we're doing the things that we do. Um, suggestions about norms, about rules, right? Um, a lot of it is about feedback, whether you're actually adhering to the rules and the expectations and the performance that you're doing. Whereas the upward communication coming from employees up to um, is usually about individual performance in a very biased way, right? <laughs> like, you know, I kind of suck at my job, but I'm good at this part. Like, you don't usually highlight that. It's like, oh no, I'm, I'm really good at what I do. Uh, a lot of it is conflict with other people. So these insinuations about people's performance. Um, the request for information is big when you think about role ambiguity, right? Like, what, are, what do you actually expect of me? What is this role? What am I supposed to be doing, right? Um, and then a lot of it is uh, conflict related, these expressions of distrust, grievances concerning the group's policies, what we're trying to do. Um, factual information is kind of an odd one, but uh, <laughs> did you know that Mount Everest is <laughs> this tall? No. <laughs> most of it is conflict related and most of it is information in a biased way about my own performance and how I'm not part of the problem, they're part of the problem. That's what most of this communication looks like. Um, and what you see, this is a big, big, big problem in industry and in companies in general, is that there's the person at the top always hears the bad news last, right? Because there's this reluctance to like share something bad that happened with your superior, and now your superior has this bad thing that happened below him that he has to take or she has to take responsibility for that now has to go up. And so there's this this kind of delay on like, okay, how am I gonna explain this in a way that doesn't look badly on me? Am I gonna scapegoat the people below me? Um, and so you have to think the people at the top are not usually getting the best information. Um, but good news goes right to the top, right? We just hit our quarterly sales, right? Like boss knows that within minutes. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing to think about. But I think wrapping up what 
what I would say is that the most important things from this lecture are going to be about thinking about uh, what are called thou shalts, right? This is what you should do. Uh, those are the things that you should really think about and question, right? We live in a structured society, meaning that people built it. And so all of those expectations, all of those roles, all of those behaviors that are expected of us are things that, that we can question. And I think we're at a really interesting time in society where we're actually seeing a lot of that happen. And I think a lot of that is because of the access to information that we have. Uh, but it's going to make your life a lot more meaningful if you do things because you want to do them and not because everybody else wants you to do them. So I will end with that.